Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, a very biased collection as usual. Um, I would like to do a little bit of linear algebra, algebra and representation theory in the next two videos. And today is a really cute theorem um, from someone whose name I probably will completely butcher. I apologize, horribly wrongly pronounced, drotzt, <laughs> whatever. So it's still a very nice theorem. And it's really this balancing act. So it's very strange. So the Jordan normal form, one of my all-time all favorite um, invariants, if you want. We'll see that anyway. It's really absolutely great. Uh, but it's kind of the last thing that really works. And it doesn't look like it should be. So it's really kind of a very strange balancing act. And the related theorem, which is super useful in, in representation theory, although it doesn't quite look like representation theory, it actually looks like representation theory. Anyway, we'll see. You don't need to know much about representation theory, uh, maybe all, almost nothing to follow this video because I will formulate everything in terms of matrix problems, essentially. Anyway, so the theorem is kind of saying that there's a very strange balancing act around the Jordan normal form. Um, and as soon as you step one step, too far to whatever, to one side, you just tip over, everything just tips over and that's it. Uh, yeah, very nice theorem. As I said, I apologize like again for mispronouncing the name. I probably just shouldn't try. I just call it the matrix theorem. Okay, so today we'll see a matrix theorem. Um, and this is how it roughly works. So we get started very slowly. We just think about vector spaces first. And we think about classifying vector spaces, something all of you have learned in linear algebra. I hope you've learned that in linear algebra. If not, then your linear algebra class was messed up. Because really, this should be one of the first statements you ever see. So we want to classify vector spaces. So here, my little vector space R3 or whatever, the ground field here doesn't really matter. And yeah, so it's determined by having volumes. That's essentially the point. So uh, every basis will spend a certain type of volume. And the solution to our little task here, classify vector spaces up to isomorphism, is they're classified by that dimension. So in three, every three-dimensional real vector space will be isomorphic to our friend here. And every 15-dimensional real vector space will be isomorphic to R50. So the solution is pretty cute and very, very simple. And again, I hope you've seen that in linear algebra. Probably not formulated as such, um, but the vector spaces are determined by the dimension is something we should learn quite early on because it's the easiest of, of its kind, as we will see. That's kind of the whole point of this theorem. Um, the theorem whose name I can't pronounce uh, is that this is kind of the easiest of its kind. So vector spaces are classified by dimension. And let me just say, this is one discrete parameter. Right? It takes values in N and there's just one of them. So it's one discrete parameter, the easiest of its kind. It somehow can't get much easier really can't get much easier. Very cute. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I do. Essentially, vector spaces are defined by what type of volumes um, the basis vectors form. So here, a three-dimensional volume. Okay, and now endomorphisms of vector spaces, matrices. Right? Matrices, certainly one of the most important objects, tools, whatever you want to call them, in mathematics altogether and kind of a natural equivalence relation on them. So here our equivalence relation was isomorphism. And now our equivalence relation is similarity, which really just means they're the same matrices up to base change. In formulas, yeah, so here's a base change, very nice. So quite the choice of bases, we just learned that from the previous theorem is kind of unimportant. So we can choose, choose any basis and uh, this is a corresponding one for the matrices. We just went one step further, right? From the object vector space itself to endomorphism of vector space matrices. Here in formulas, there exists the matrix P would need to be invertible to make sense here, such that A equals whatever, right? So they are the same matrices up to base change. And let's say we want to do the same as before. We want to classify them in a certain sense. And in this video, for the rest of the video, I will stay over C. Um, really just because the theorems get so difficult that we are already very, very happy that we can say something over C. So uh, natural question is, what if you have no, non, non algebraically closed field, what if you have, have your finite fields or something? Yeah, so very difficult. So let's just say over C. Anyway, let me repeat what we want to do. 
we classify vector spaces and now we classify endomorphisms of vector spaces up to base change or we, that's what we try. And it has a really beautiful solution. Spoiler, spoiler, my beloved Jordan normal form. Right, Jordan normal form, those little Jordan blocks with some eigenvalues on the diagonal and a certain size of a Jordan block. So here's size four, two, size one, size two, size three, whatever. And the theorem is two matrices are similar if and only if, uh, the good old if and only if, if and only if, um, if and only if, they have the same Jordan normal form, which is an absolutely fabulous classification. So it's much more difficult than the previous one for vector spaces, but we are looking at endomorphisms of vector spaces. So we should expect uh, something more, more difficult. And really, this is now classified here. Here comes the measure of how this is more difficult by finally many discrete parameters, which are my block sizes. Yeah, so whatever, a certain uh, sequence of them, the sizes of the Jordan blocks, and finally many continuous parameters, which are really just the eigenvalues, right? The eigenvalues can now take uh, any, whatever I said, complex number. So that's already much more difficult in some sense and still very satisfying. It's not so, not so bad. So here, just one discrete parameter. Here, kind of still finitely many, but discrete and continuous parameters. And the question is, what happens if we go on? Um, I will show you the conjugation problem if you go on in a second. But let me just state now the theorem. Again, keep in mind, it's the one that I can't pronounce, so I probably shouldn't do it. I just call it the matrix theorem. <laughs> anyway, so it's really this, <laughs> this kind of fun. The clearly impossible puzzle. We'll come back to that in a second. So we have this three-fold symmetry, uh, the three-fold theorem, whatever. Um, green is probably a horrible color here, so let's go to black. Exactly one of the following holes for A modules. And A modules is really just an action of an algebra. You can think of act, a group acting on a vector space if you want. And the indecomposables here are the elements of the theory, um, and they correspond to indecomposable Jordan blocks in the analogy we had before. And there are only three possibilities how a classification can look like. And that's a, a kind of a shocking theorem. There are only three possibilities. So we have finally many discrete parameters, case one, which is really just case like vector spaces. There is a classification that looks like the classification for vector spaces. These are the easy ones. Then there's case two, which is the classification like in the Jordan normal form. So when you have uh, discrete and continuous parameters, but finally many. And then there is the slightly disappointing case three, which is my impossibility puzzle, the clearly impossibility puzzle. Um, there's simply no, there's no classification scheme. You can forget it. So it's, it's something you can prove that it's kind of Turing incomplete. So you can really not do it. You can simply forget it. And that's kind of a very strange theorem. So it's either super easy, reasonably easy, or impossible, right? There's nothing in between. Super easy, like vector spaces, reasonably easy, like um, uh, conjugation of matrices, or forget it. <laughs> it's kind of a really fun theorem. Um, and there are a lot of algebra problems. And kind of this theorem is just saying that there are a lot of algebra problems. It's just a formal way of saying that most algebra problems will fall into this uh, Three-fold symmetry, like one, two, three. There's either very simple, simple, or impossible. Kind of very strange. So in some sense, our Jordan theorem stays here. And if you go a little bit further, that's kind of the story I would like to explain, uh, or th that's kind of the story of this uh, video. Then it kind of breaks apart immediately. There is no classification scheme anymore, which is kind of really weird and well, kind of very surprising. I still find that very surprising, even after knowing this for many years, and it kind of comes up in many different disguises. So if you have seen Kruva representations or something, uh, you might have seen some statements of the same type. And I stole this XKCD comic, which is really, really fun in the sense that, um, of course, sure, we did that for mathematics, because for algebra and representation theory, because then we can write down a formal statement. But essentially, the same is true kind of always in life or very often in life, that there's some kind of a subtle step from, oh, yeah, this is easy to, but impossible. <laughs> Here in this little comic, it's like, um, OK, there's someone takes a photo and try to get their position. Easy, just do some GPS. 
try to recognize objects on the picture like what well, done impossible like it takes takes a uh well, well in this case i need a research team in five years it's kind of a statement like it's essentially impossible so kind of that's kind of the story i would like to say uh, or like to tell which as i said happens in life all the time but somewhat in mathematics we have the advantage of making everything precise uh, there's a cost, and the cost is it's not as easy to explain anymore, right? So um, you can explain to everyone, like, there are really subtle differences in life when you just go one step further and it gets impossible, and everyone knows examples of that, but that's kind of very hard to, to make uh, formal, and as soon as you make it formal, it looks like this, but essentially this trifold theorem here is saying exactly that, right? So there's this, the, the first two are kind of the easy part, and then there's an infinitely big step to it's, it's hopeless. Um, here's a more mathematical example. So similarity, we have seen that the Jordan normal form here has a really kind of, I, I really love the Jordan normal, normal form. I hope you love it as well. So it has a really cute solution, this Jordan normal form. And as soon as you try to do that on pairs of matrices, the simultaneous, uh, simultaneous similarity, oh, very difficult word, this is just out of reach. So that's really, really difficult. And I will not discuss it in this video. It's way too difficult for me. It's kind of this, this one step further from Jordan normal form. It's exactly this uh, one step here. And it's just is is immediately the clearly impossible puzzle here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And I also hope to see you next time.